Hello everyone and welcome back to our Democracy Fundamentals webinar series. Today we will be uh, focusing on how government works and specifically the municipal level. My name is Beatrice Alas. And I'm Bill Shu. We will be co-facilitating today's webinar. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that most of the content in this presentation comes directly from Maitri Foundation's Building Blocks Train the Trainer program. You can access their tools at the website on the screen. As well, uh, several of the slides come from the City of Toronto's Election Outreach Network's My Local Government Training held on November 1st, 2017 at City Hall. For their tools, you can email elections at toronto.ca. Local governments were established by provinces to manage local affairs. They are the only level of government that is not in our constitution. They are created by provincial laws and overseen by the appropriate ministries. So in our case, in Ontario, it is overseen by municip all municipalities across Ontario are overseen by the Ministry of Municipal Affairs. Local governments are often referred to as municipal government. And although school boards are technically not municipal governments, and are governed by the Ministry of Education, not the Ministry of Municipal Affairs. But we do um, touch on school boards uh, in this series, and the reason is because trustees are elected, that's an elected position, and they are elected during municipal elections. Now, the powers of the municipal governments are determined by the provincial government. Um, there are three different types of municipal government structures, um, which are regional regions, counties, and single-tier municipalities. So um, regional, um, basically some parts of Ontario has two municipal governments, a local municipal and regional government that together serves um, the local municipalities. The regional level has more servicing responsibilities than a county, while there are variations from one region to another. Services usually provided by regions include um, arterial roads, transit, policing, sewer and water systems, waste disposal, region-wide land use planning and development, as well as health, housing, and social services. The local municipalities within regions are generally responsible for local roads, fire protection, garbage collection, recreation, and local land use planning needs. All municipalities in a region participate in the regional system. Um, so now counties. Counties exist only in southern Ontario. Local municipalities such as cities, towns, villages, and townships within counties provide the majority of municipal services to their residents. The services provided by county governments are usually limited to arterial roads, health and social services, and county land use planning. Local municipalities in counties raise taxes for their own purposes, as well as for county and school board purposes. So now single tier, um, single tier municipalities exist across Ontario. They include municipalities that are geographically located within a county, but are not a part of the county for municipal purposes. Single tier municipalities also include those former county or regional, regional municipalities that have recently been amalgamated. Single tier municipalities have responsibilities for all local services to their residents. So as you can see in the map, um, the city of Toronto is a single tier municipality. In Canada, each level of government has its own areas of responsibility. Let's watch a video produced by TV Ontario to learn more about these. <gasps> garbage! Look at this garbage! I'm so angry, I'm going to write a letter to the federal government. Oh, I wouldn't do that. Garbage is not a federal responsibility. Well, in that case, I'm going to write a letter to the provincial government. Actually, garbage is not a provincial responsibility either. It's a municipal responsibility. Canada has three main levels of government, and they are each responsible for different areas. Ah, all these different levels of government. 
It's so confusing. I just want to know. Who does what? Who does what? I really want to know. Who does what? That's what I'm going to show ya. I'm not just talking to you, but I'm back to all ya. I'm going to explain about the federal government in Ottawa. Important, they're in charge of our national security. This includes defense and the military. Canada's often dealing with other nations, so they are in charge of international relations. You say you want to become a Canadian? Then go talk to citizenship and immigration. They're also in charge of the money and the banking, and next time you write a letter, it's them you should be thanking, for they also take care of the postal service. You want to learn more? I've only scratched the surface, but curious friend, keep on listening up. I'm going to tell you more about who does what. Not the provinces. They are different situations, got their own responsibilities as a part of this nation, because this country is so big and tall. It's too much for the federal government to take care of it all, so they split some things up and give it to Ontario. Schools and education are provincial, don't you know? Dig a little deeper and you will see that health care is also a provincial responsibility. And the social assistance and natural resources, you know, energy, wildlife, and of course all the fishes. Well, we're at it. Say you want to drive a car, you'll need a license from the province or you won't get far. You want to know more? Well, you're in luck, because I'm going to keep talking about who does what. Who does what? I really want to know. Who does what? That's what I'm going to show you. All right, moving along, getting to the nitty gritty municipal covers, the towns and the city. So municipal deals with things that are local, like your library or even snow removal. There's also public transit to get you place to place. Listen up, kids, I'm going to pick up the pace. You want to build a new house so you can live it to the max. You'll need the building permit, you'll need property tax, you'll need water. What about the garbage you produce? These things are all live under municipal roof. You got me going with the level, give up. So as you may appreciate from this video, municipal governments in Ontario are responsible for providing many of the services within their local boundaries that we rely on on a daily basis, such as water and sewage, electric utilities, public transit, planning for new community developments and enhancing existing neighborhoods, maintenance of the local road network, including snow removal, library services, police services, fire services, public health, childcare, animal control and bylaw enforcement, parks and recreation, property assessment, arts and culture, long-term care and senior housing, economic development, ambulances, airports, provincial offenses administration, tax collection, sidewalks, storm sewers, social services, social housing, garbage collection, and of course, recycling. So now, um, in terms of the roles of the municipal government, um, and the municipal council. So municipal councils have a broad range of responsibilities. Um, so one of them is to represent the public and to consider the well-being and interests of the municipality. Um, they are also going to develop and evaluate the policies and programs of the municipality, um, as well as to ensure that administrative policies, practices, and procedures are in place to implement the decisions of council and to ensure the accountability and transparency of the operations of the municipality, including the activities of the senior management of the municipality, and also to maintain the financial integrity of the municipality, as well as to carry out the duties assigned to it by law. So who's on council? 
Depending on your municipality, the head of council may be called a warden, a chair, a reeve, or a mayor. Wardens lead city, uh, county councils. Mayors and reeves, reeves lead single-tier councils like Toronto, Mississauga, and Newmarket. Chairs lead reg regional councils like Peel and York. Whatever title is preferred, the role of head of council as set out by the Municipal Act of 2001 remains the same. It is the role of the head of council to act as the municipality's chief executive officer, to preside over council meetings, although in the city of Toronto a speaker is, assigned, is named, to provide the council with leadership and information and recommendations, and to represent the municipality at official functions. With such responsibilities, the head of council has a prominent public profile. Nevertheless, decisions of the municipality are made by council as a whole. The head of council does not have any more power than any other member of council to make decisions on behalf of the municipality. In some cities, the mayor has a lot of power. The mayor can hire and fire staff. They can spend money when they want to and make policy. In Toronto, the mayor has fewer powers. The mayor can hire and fire the head staff person and appoint people to committees, but council has to approve it. If council says no, the mayor's decision can be reversed. As a result, the mayor is really just one very prominent councillor. So um, the role of councillors is to represent constituents, make policy, and provide stewardship in their municipality. Often these roles will overlap. Councillors will be called on to consider and make decisions on issues that will sometimes be complex and controversial. Most of these decisions will have long-term consequences for municipalities that extend beyond each four-year term of office and should be made in the context of long-term health and welfare of their communities. So councillors were elected by constituents to represent their views as closely as possible when dealing with issues that come before council. However, constituents um, have many views and opinions and you cannot represent all of them all of the time. Um, so election to office require councillors to have a broader understanding of the issues. In practice, there is no single correct approach to represent um, the um, constituents and on most issues counselor may find that they fall somewhere between two opposing viewpoints. Um, policies provide direction for running a municipality. Policy making is another key responsibility of um, the counselors. Many council decisions are routine dealing with the ongoing administration of the municipality but others establish general principles to help guide future decisions and actions. Those are often considered policy decisions. Some policies can be specific, such as a bylaw requiring dogs to be kept on leashes in public areas, and others can be broader and more general, such as approval of an official plan. The structure for governing a municipality is based on the committee system. In order to carry out the broad range of responsibilities, councils often have a number of standing committees consisting of councillors only or advisor, advisory committees made up of a mix of councillors and members appointed from the public. These committees carry out much of the work of council and then report back to council with recommendations. At committee meetings, councillors may hear from the public, ask questions, receive advice from staff and experts, discuss issues and develop recommendations for council's approval. Standing committees make recommendations on citywide issues such as parks, garbage and recycling, housing and planning. The four community councils make recommendations on local issues such as traffic lights, parking permits and fence bylaws. Commit council and committee meetings. Committees are each made up of between three and 13 councillors. They hear from the public and make recommendations to city council on specific items. City council and its committees meet on a four to five week cycle throughout the year. Each cycle starts with committee meetings and ends with a full city council meeting. For the most part, council and committee meetings are scheduled at the beginning of the new term of council and follow a consistent schedule meeting monthly at the same time and location. 
Meeting agendas and supplementary information such as reports and communications are released to the public in advance, at least a week prior to meetings. Often councils and committees follow a consent agenda process. Consent agendas allow counselors to review a very lengthy agenda and designate some items for full debate. Items that counselors do not feel merit debate are voted on at the beginning of the meeting. Have the cons sorry, <laughs> items that counselors do not feel merit debate are voted on at the beginning of the meeting. And thus they have the consent of counselors to proceed directly to a vote. Um, so now in terms of standing committees, there are eight of them in city council. Um, the executive committee is chaired by the mayor and all other committees are chaired by counselors. The executive committee, committee makes recommendations on council's policies and priorities, financial planning and budget, um, including revenue and tax policies, relationships with other governments, um, councils and its operations, and human resources and labor relations. Um, so the second standing committee that I'm going to talk about is the Community Development and Recreation Committee, which makes recommendations to strengthen services to communities and neighborhoods. So some examples of this are ice rinks, community grants, and shelter support. Um, and then we also have the Economic Development Committee, which um, makes recommendations to strengthen Toronto's economy and investment opportunities. Um, one of them would, some examples of them would be um, BIAs, which are business improvement areas, airports, film and television industry, hotels, tourism. Um, and the next committee is the Government Management Committee, which makes recommendations on the administrative operations of the city, management of the city's assets and resources, and some of the examples of these would include property taxes, purchasing of property, and lease agreements. Um, the next standing committee is the Licensing and Standards Committee, which makes recommendations about the licensing of businesses and enforcement of property standards. So some examples of this would be bylaws regarding things such as service animals and parked vehicles. And the next um, standing committee is the Parks and Environment Committee, which makes recommendations on the sustainable use of Toronto's natural environment. Um, some examples of this would be um, having conversations around climate change, energy storage, trees, parks, and bike parking. Um, another standing committee is the Planning and Growth Management Committee, which makes recommendations on planning, growth, and development of the city. Some examples um, would include zoning bylaws, city planning, and growth. And the last standing committee that I'm going to be talking about is the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee, which makes recommendations on Toronto's infrastructure needs and services. Some examples of this would be transportation, road safety, waste collection, sewers, water, and bike lanes. As I mentioned before, there are also four community councils. And if you were around in the late 1990s, you may remember that the city of Toronto used to be a, a six cities. Um, and so these four community councils reflect the old um, six cities that were amalgamated in uh, 1998. So the four community councils are the Etobicoke York Council, the Toronto and East York Council, the North York Council, and the Scarborough Council. And just a reminder that final decisions are made at full city council meetings. Um, so after uh, decisions are made at the different committees, they then go to the full uh, council for final approval. Um, another reminder is that you can talk to other councillors that might not represent you in your ward, but might sit on a committee or board that makes decisions on something that you're interested in. So you don't necessarily just have to talk to your own councillor, you can talk to other councillors as well. Okay, now we're going to talk about uh, what are sometimes called ABCCs. ABCCs stand for agencies, boards, commissions, and corporations. So city council helps to manage its workload by delegating certain responsibilities uh, to these, to these ABCCs. 
Boards of agencies and corporations govern and manage various city services on behalf of city council. The board's members of agencies and corporate boards include councillors and members of the public who contribute their skills and experience to the running of the city. Many important services are administered on behalf of the city and the community through these, the separate city agencies, boards, commissions, and corporations, and other special purpose bodies, which are also called SPBs, each having its own relationship with city council. Other services are administered through corporations that are partnered with the city. ABCCs range in size and scope from large corporations with a lot of authority over their own operations, such as Toronto Hydro Corporation or Toronto Community Housing Corporation. Corporations of hundreds of millions of dollars to small community-based boards that rely on community involvement and volunteers to deliver programs, such as Community Centre 55. Municipal agencies, boards, and commissions can include, but are not limited to, Police Services Board, Public Library Board, Transit Commission, such as Toronto Transit Commission, and Boards of Health, such as Toronto Public Health. Um, on the, this is a, a, a graphic um, representation of all of these ABCCs um, across the city, and you can go to the website on the slide for more details on each one. So now at this point, um, you may be wondering how decisions are made in City Council. So in terms of the decision-making process in City Council, there are many steps in each decision-making process, and each one can hit snags or get derailed, so they aren't all the same, but they tend to follow a pattern, which is represented by the flowchart that you see above. Um, so the more you know about the process of decision-making, the easier it is to participate. Um, the better you know the steps and the people who are responsible for them, the more input you and your community can have. Um, so usually someone decides to make a policy. Sometimes that's a politician who may be responding to a community or an idea they have. Sometimes it's staff who are trying to solve a problem they have found. Sometimes a policy is required either because the province imposes it or the policy um, already in place indicates a review or change by a certain date or time. So the policy is usually considered and worked on by staff earlier in the process to come up with a clear proposal and to review the details. Then policies are usually reviewed by the elected officials who sit on relevant committees. They can approve, amend, or reject the policy or send it right back to the staffs to work on it more. Um, if the policy doesn't get sent back to staff, the decision of the committee goes to the full council. So now the council can accept the decision of the committee or reject it or change it. They can also just send it back and ask the committee to do more work on it. The other important element in um, governing of the municipality is, of course, the, the staff. Um, and here you have uh, the City of Toronto's organizational chart. Um, at the very top, of course, you have the city manager. Well, at the very top, actually, you have city council. Um, and then, of course, city manager and then everybody else. Um, staff have a lot more power in local governments. The structure of the staff system is also more coordinated in local government. In municipalities, power is more diffuse. No one clearly has control of any single policy area like health or environment, as we might see in the other two levels of government. As a result, the staff play a bigger role in decision making. Staff develop the proposals and recommendations that go to boards, councils, and committees. They don't get monitored in that role by anyone who is clearly their political boss while they do that. What they recommend is largely passed, in part because they control much of the information that is provided as well. Since staff report to council as a whole, it's harder for any elected official to press them to act more quickly or focus more on any given issue or policy. At each stage of decision making, the staff are a key player. Councillors depend a lot on them and don't have a lot of capacity to assess their advice. When policies come to committees, staff have far more information than the elected officials. When policies move forward from committees to council, staff still have a lot more information than, than others and can generally get the outcome they are seeking. 
As elected officials change, sometimes with every election, staff are consistent and become experts on issues, the process, and hold more institutional history that shapes council decisions. In local governments, all reporting lines are clearer. Everyone reports to the chief administrative officer. While there's overall accountability to council, there's no one person on council that can hire, fire, or direct staff. Only the hierarchy of civil service staff. So now in terms of getting involved in the city council, um, of the three levels of government in Canada, the municipal level is the easiest one to participate in because it's so accessible, um, because council, committee, staffs, and councillors are all within reach. Um, so in terms of assessing information, accessing information, um, open government is about improving the delivery of services, making information more accessible, and supporting initiatives that build public trust and confidence in government. City information is very much public and everyone has a right to access it. The City of Toronto archives keep records that document Toronto's history. Um, the open data portal provides raw data sets for public use. You can also visit toronto.ca or call 311 to access more information regarding the city. Um, to participate in the consultation, um, city staffs often consult the public in a variety of ways to gather in, uh, input about local or citywide issues through um, meetings, open houses, and online forums. So participating, these are also crucial in getting involved in city council. Now you can also participate in a committee meeting. Um, so you can speak about an issue at a committee meeting. You can write to the city council or a committee. You can also submit a petition to the committee. Um, you can do all of those things at toronto.ca slash council. And to apply to serve on a city board, um, members of the public um, can apply and are appointed by the council. Um, so to, to be able to serve on a city board, you must be a resident of the city of Toronto. You must be at least 18 years of age and you must not be a relative to a member of city council and not be a city board employee. So um, you can also click on the link below um, to access some more information regarding how to serve on a city board. Um, so right now there are more than 60 um, agencies, boards, commissions, and corporations in Toronto. And just one final note, we are having uh, the next municipal elections on Monday, October, uh, Monday, October 22nd, 2018. Um, and we'd like to remind you to not forget to vote. And of course, you can also volunteer. You can also work in the next municipal elections and participate in many other ways. Thank you. Thank you.